So Vaya Ansari retired from cricket last year at the age of 25, um, and he had recently played for the international cricket team. Uh, he's now pursuing a career in law, and he said, cricket is not the end for me, my life is not directed towards it, cricket is a part of my life. Um, does that resonate with you and your own decision to uh, leave rowing at that age? I think that's absolutely right, yeah, for sure. I think I've heard from a lot of elite sportsmen, they don't like the idea of being defined by their sport. Another one is um, David Pocock, who's the uh, Australian rugby player. I remember him saying something like this. I think he was player of the tournament or something in, in the 2015 Rugby World Cup. So he's getting a lot of press attention and he came out and said, you know, I love rugby, but I actually kind of hate the idea of being a rugby player. And I suppose I was kind of the same. I love rowing, but I didn't really like the idea of being a rower. And often I'd meet people and they'd be like, oh, you're the rower. And <laughs> I actually really hated that. Yeah. Um, which is not to do the sport down. I loved it and it's given me more than pretty much anything else has ever given me. Um, but yeah, I think if, you, if I stayed in it till, you know, till I was 40 or something, then it's, it's very difficult to go off and do something else mm -hmm. um, rather than trying to have a career on the coattails of your sporting success. Right, and so you study while training, um, taking a year out of university to train for Rio and you now have a first class degree. Um, do you think this has helped with life post-rowing as opposed to other people who cannot perhaps study alongside doing some sport at the highest level? I think all that's helped really in one way, which is tolerating pressure. Um, right. Funnily enough, doing uh, one, of, one of the kind of, supposedly one of the truisms of, of studying and doing sport to a high level is it makes you super organized. And I was never really that organized. I just was really good under pressure. So when I had a deadline, or whatever it was, I could, you know, I could tolerate the, 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 the pressure of the deadline or I could tolerate the sleep loss or, and, and just get stuff done. But I never, not really until finals did I learn to be actually organized about stuff. It's still something I'm learning. But one thing it definitely did teach me was just to be calm under pressure um, and when there's too much on your plate, just to, to crack on and focus on what you can control. Brilliant. And do you think other sports could or should do the same as rowing has done for you to accommodate higher education, or is the, there a reason rowing is an exception? I think rowing, well, rowing is a very traditional sport. A lot of athletes come to rowing through, through university. Fewer yeah. now, I think. Uh, you know, talent ID schemes and a focus on clubs has made it the base a bit broader, which is obviously super helpful, and it's just one reason why British rowing is doing quite well. Um, uh, I also think rowing kind of reluctantly accepted that I was doing my degree. And, you know, I don't, they, they certainly, I, to be very clear, I was, I think I'm right in saying I was the only person, uh, certainly on the heavyweight men's side during my time in the senior team, who did what I did. Maybe other people didn't, did it in a smaller way, or, but, but, you know, essentially, I think, if, I think if they see someone who they definitely know they want and who is pretty unyielding, then that they'll find a way to accommodate them and let them do their degree. But, but you know, I, I don't think they're, they don't exactly encourage people to go and broaden their horizons and study while they do rowing. I think other sports, yeah, for sure. I, I, I like the idea that all sports kind of make it easy for their charges to go and broaden their horizons and, and just prepare for life after sport. In general, I think, but, the, you know, the, the directors of these sports don't really have an interest and they just kind of want control. Right. And do you think that willingness or that control infects the people, uh, the charges, as you said, and stops them thinking about life after sport so much as perhaps you were? Mm. Yeah, I think that's right. I think especially if you stay in the sport too long. I think if you, I mean, you stay in, uh, well, who am I to say they're staying in too long? But if you stay in until your mid-30s or your late-30s or something, I could think it can be very difficult to transition. And certainly in rowing, to be honest, I, you know, I, I think, I think there were people who stayed in that, that length of time, and it might have been the right decision, but I, what I can say with some confidence is that the, you know, the national team still got a way to go to, to really um, give those people time to like, you know, develop their skills. There are, there are systems in place, and there are really good people working to try and bring, bring those opportunities to the rowers, but the coaches don't give the athletes time to actually take advantage of those opportunities. Right, interesting. And so, is that a problem, do you think? Um, obviously, this is a problem that transcends, obviously, just rowing is a problem in a lot of sports, mm. people not really know what to do with mm. themselves, and obviously, you had a plan five, year, five years in advance that 2016 was mm. going to be that. And have you seen uh, sort of 
colleagues or people around you that you've heard stories mm. that people obviously really struggle mm. when they do leave the, leave a sport in their mid thirties and that's all they've ever done and it's all they've ever known. Um, mm. I suppose, do you feel as though there needs to be more, I guess, schemes in place mm. to help people deal with life afterwards mm. because there's so much life left? I think it would be unfair to say there need to be more schemes in place because I think UK Sport and a number of other bodies have really tried to do this. Um, what they haven't been able to do is to, to make the coaches, to force the coaches to give the athletes time to take advantage of them. I think there are, there are plenty of people working on this problem. Um, but yeah, you know, athletes are tired day to day. They're working really hard and they need to be given you know, proper time to, to take advantage of this stuff. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, you're free you know, in, in the evening before bed to go and do an online course because pe people are just knackered. You know, they need to be given, you know, give them, give them a half day every Thursday to go and do this stuff or, or something meaningful. Um, because yeah, I, I, can certainly, I can certainly think of examples of people who got out the other end and, and suddenly realized it, w it was all they'd known and actually that, just that psychological change from being a world beater to being right at the bottom of the pile is, is, can be really difficult. Right. And the way you've managed this, because you, you've got the degree and you've done the rowing and now you have the job, um, do you feel as though at any path along the way did you have to compromise and make a decision that you didn't think was perfect for you? Were you shoehorned into any particular direction in the face of another priority? Mm. To be really honest, I was very lucky. Um, I was lucky that m my level of performance was high enough that I could go to the national team and say, look, I'm doing this degree and I'm going to take a year out to do the London Olympics and then I'm going to go back to Oxford and then I'm going to make myself available for the Rio Olympics. Um, and they said, fine, you know, great. We, we, we accept that that's what you want to do and we still want you. Um, yeah, there were times when I felt that, you know, that the use of time wasn't always the best and actually I could have spent less time at the training center and probably performed better, but that's more of a kind of day-to-day -day coaching decision than a, than a broader um, issue of, of athlete autonomy. Um, so generally, no, I was, I was very lucky. I was able to combine my education and my rowing and, and still lead some sort of social life um, and come out the end of it feeling good about it. Okay, so when you were at Goldman Sachs in that just the that time after you've been traveling and after you sort of uh, retired from rowing, was there a time when you said you were coasting there a bit perhaps? Were there times that we thought, okay, no, this is definitely for me. I should definitely try again with a different job. Or was that a moment where you thought, have I made a mistake here? Yeah, I never thought I'd made a massive mistake because I'd never committed to anything very long term. I was at Goldman Sachs for six months only and I did an internship. Um, so it, it was always just sort of trying it out, trying to, trying to learn some stuff. Um, I suppose, I, yeah, I, I maybe didn't do that well, just feeling like there wasn't something I, I couldn't really dig my teeth into. Uh, whereas now, you know, I'm, I'm actually working longer hours doing what I do now, but I love it. Yeah. Um, uh, and, I, and I wake up about it in the middle of the night and get stressed about it because I really care about it. But I'd rather it be that way. I, you know, maybe I need to wind back on that a little bit and be able to switch off from it. Or well, that's what my girlfriend would say. But um, uh, I think, yeah, yeah I, I'd rather just have something I feel really, really strongly about. Um, whereas when I, yeah, when I was doing that, I just uh, didn't, I, I just felt a bit unstimulated. So you had the awareness that this isn't all there is in the working world outside of sport? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose I was slightly led by a lot of my contemporaries who went into very solid, traditional professions. And then, well, I had one to, uh, guy I'm working with, now, the guy who hired me, uh, to be honest, he wasn't really a friend, he was an acquaintance, but he, uh, but he got in touch um, and presented the whole other end of the spectrum, the kind of startup world, go and build something yourself that you feel, you know, you feel really strongly about the product and the, the whole uh, industry, the space and the audience. Um, and it's obviously very high risk, but we're young, so now's the time. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, and I tell you what, it's, it's a fraction of the money, but, uh, but it's super fun. Right, brilliant. And one of my final questions is, uh, again, going back to that interview with the BBC two years ago, I don't know if you saw that, but they headlined it as last of the posh boys. Um, referring yeah, to Rome. yeah, To yeah. what extent, because I know that you won't have had a role in that headline and how it works, but um, to what extent do you agree with that headline? I got really pissed off at that headline. Right. Um, <laughs> I had an interview with the BBC journalist whose name I can't remember, and he was, you know, he's kind of very softly, softly, very, you know, sort of fine about everything. And then suddenly the whole article took on a focus that I didn't, obviously I didn't intend, but I also didn't 
anticipate from my conversation with him. It, it, and to be honest, you just expect better at the BBC. You know, if you're, if you're talking to certain outlets, you expect that. Um, so yeah, I, I, that wasn't great. But in fairness to me, yeah, maybe it's, it's, it's kind of true. You know, I think I look about it, around at who I rode with and uh, I rode with a guy called George Nash, who in many ways was from quite a similar background, but apart from him in the national team level, it was, as I say, it was a much broader base. Um, it was guys who come up through local clubs or through talent ID schemes. Uh, you know, these talent ID schemes go into uh, well, they, they go into state schools, really, which, which you know a lot of rows traditionally were from private schools, like I went to, and, and so they go out into schools which don't normally row, and they identify people and say you're really tall, or you know you've got good aerobic capacity, or whatever it is, try rowing. And so a lot of the people I was rowing with came through those routes, and it's it's why we were of quite a high standard because we our pool was really big. Right. So was, what was it about that story and the angle they took that sort of sat, didn't sit quite right with you? Yeah, I suppose he, the journalist kind of hunted down some details and then twisted them um, and just led with a few things, which I don't even, when I, when, I suppose when I think about myself and how I perceive myself, I don't, there are some things which I don't consider at all important. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm actually I'm not going to list them because they they really don't figure in in my perception of myself. I'm not that's not to say I'm ashamed of them, but he really led with like three things that he'd really yeah. picked out um, as if it, as if they just characterised me, and I didn't feel they did. Brilliant, thank you, Constantine Lewis. Thank you so much for being with us. Not at all. Thanks very much. <laughs>